where the deficiencies are, and then they develop the strategies going forward. Now that sounds nerdy, maybe, a little wonky, but if we're serious about this, then we ought to make sure it's outcome-based. And the federal government, so now, fast forward, the federal government doesn't have any of this criteria. If you go to Head Start, they spend three times, four times, I mean, it's a lot of money. It's not necessarily outcome-based. It's very expensive. And I would say states ought to have the right to pool the early childhood monies that the federal government has to expand their own efforts. And so if New Hampshire is serious about this and believes it's important, then they should have the access to, they should fund it. It ought to be a state responsibility in Florida. We don't, you know, it's 600 million bucks right out of the coffers of the, of the state government, at least it used to be when I was there. And we can then take, draw down federal dollars to expand it. It ought to be a state driven deal. And the federal government ought to have the flexibility to provide support based on the New Hampshire way. It might not be the same as Florida, but it ought to be outcome based. It ought to be focused on assuring that more kids can read when, by the time they get to, to uh, kindergarten, that they're in safe conditions while they're, while they're in these, um, these early childhood uh, locations. I think that's a far better plan than the Hillary plan, because I just, I guess, I just, I'm, he, she hasn't had a plan yet, but this, trust me, she's coming. And it'll be top-down driven. It'll be the progressive liberal agenda. It'll require teacher union, you know, teachers that are teaching four-year-olds. And it'll be extraordinarily expensive, and it'll fail. And then the argument then will be we need more federal money to spend. And the net result is the vicious cycle keeps on going. We should start thinking bottom up rather than top down. Thanks for being with us, Governor Bush. Yeah. Okay, let me study this. <laughs> According to Sergeant Marty Trainer and other law enforcement officials in Sarasota, Florida, the files and information pertaining to 9-11 uh, hijacker pilots Marwan al Shahi, Muhammad Atta, and Ziad Jara from Huffman Aviation Flight School in Venice, Florida, which was operated by Rudy Deckers and financed by Wally Hilliard, were loaded onto two rider trucks and driven right onto a C-130 cargo plane, uh, which left Sarasota less than a day after 9-11. Is it true that you were on board the C-130? And if so, <laughs> can you tell us what became of the files? Thank you. No, it's not true. <laughs> a little weird. Dial it back there. Monty, I don't know who Monty is, but this is completely false. Yes, sir. I think we've all been surprised over the last two can I just Let me just make qualify this. Yeah, I was in the emergency operations center trying to make sure that the state of Florida was safe. I was trying to work with local officials to figure out how schools would start up. I was, I was working with Disney and the space program to make sure that another attack wouldn't hit and devastate our economy. I started working to figure out how we were going to stimulate the lack of travel to our state early so that we could, we could recover quickly, and we did. That's what I did. So that was kind of a weird email that you read. Yes? So in the last two days, I think we've all been surprised to discover that half the country have been closeted constitutional scholars. So, what is your approach? Oh, sorry. <laughs> what is your approach to constitutional interpretation, and how will that guide your approach to nominating Supreme Court justices? Great, great question. Uh, first of all, I'm, I'm the uh, former chairman of the National Constitution Center, and for those that love the Constitution, I really recommend you go into the museum in Philadelphia. It's at the end of the mall. It's a concrete building. It's not quite as beautiful as the old colonial buildings, but it is, it's spectacular inside. And it's a tribute to the greatest document ever created. I fell in love with the Constitution again when I had a chance to be the, the chairman of it, of this uh, museum honoring the Constitution. And I think, as, as it relates to picking appellate court, all, all, all federal judges, but particularly appellate court judges and Supreme Court justices, the two criteria, the three criteria that matter are obviously intelligence and persuading skills, that you have to be able to, it's a collegial process, you need to convince and persuade people that may not be completely uh, sharing your philosophy, that the philosophy that undergirds your decision making is based on not legislating from the bench, not wandering off away from the, the, the constructs of the Constitution, but strictly interpreting the law. And third, that you have a proven record that goes along with it. One of the frustrations that I've had is that, that people that don't have a proven record get appointed to the court, and then they, they wander. 
And you go, how could that be? I mean, you know, it, it's just a, it's a challenge. So the reason why we have picked people that haven't had judicial experience to positions, appellate court level and Supreme Court level, is that it's, you, it requires a fight to get it done. Because we're in this partisan environment now where every one of these, these appointees will be, it'll be a big, huge fight. And so I believe we need to have people of experience, of a proven record, a consistent judicial philosophy that you know because they've done it over and over and over again. And then you gotta fight like hell to make sure they get passed. And that's my pledge, because I think it's really important that we have a Supreme Court that honors our Constitution, that recognizes that, that the, the, there are limits to what the judiciary can do, that the legislature has the ability to create law, the executive has the responsibility to execute on those laws faithfully, and the judiciary, I think, should be limited to strictly interpreting what the Constitution says. Thank you. One more, one more before I head off. Thank you, Governor, for taking my question. I actually recently, recently read a piece about your niece, uh, Barbara. It was talking about millennials and giving back and how a story yeah. about how, how she founded the Global Health Corps. She's involved and, in uh, the same. Yeah, she was uh, doing that. And so, you know, it's apparent that the Bush generation, they, you guys really care about global health, saving lives, and also like, at the same time strengthening health systems so these, these like, deadly epidemics don't make their way into U.S. soil. Exactly. So I was wondering, if you're elected, will you Commit to fully funding a U.S. one-third share of the global fund so we can fight. Yeah, no, continue I'm, I'm, fighting TB, AIDS, and malaria. Yeah, no, I think we need to continue that. It's a great success, and it's a look. In terms of foreign policy, it, but basically we've talked about the hard power of foreign policy, which is really important. There needs to be certainty in our foreign policy, and it needs to be backed up by military might and a counterintelligence and intelligent capability that keeps us safe. But when we have that, it's a soft power is hugely effective. If we just hollow out the hard power and focus solely on soft power, we're not going to have the same maximum benefit that soft power can bring. But together, they can play a really constructive role. And I just would urge, you know, there are a lot of people that say we, we should have no foreign aid. I, I disagree with that. But our foreign aid should be relevant, and it should be effective, and it should be outcome-based. You don't have to spend more money. You just keep replicating the, and rewarding the programs that actually work and save lives, where you're creating infrastructures in countries that didn't exist before. You're not propagating and perpetuating regimes that are dictatorships or crony capitalists. You're actually creating a more democratic environment for a more peaceful world by having success. And people admire the United States when they see these programs effectively done. And we need that. We need to have friends. And it's not bad. I'll conclude with another story about, about the special nature of our country. Uh, I got to go, I was asked by my brother to go to um, Thailand and Indonesia after the tsunami. You remember that? It was uh, 2000 and 2004. In December, General Powell, Secretary Powell and I went representing the United States. And we went to Thailand first, and it was incredible. This, this resort was just wiped out. Had pictures of all these lost loved ones, tourists from all around the world, <coughs> family members are seeking them out. It was really, really heartbreaking. Then we went to Indonesia, to Banda Aceh, this uh, uh, island where uh, the night before I was in Jakarta and the UN was refugee person was kind of bragging a little too much about how they were already on the ground, they were doing all this work and they were really great and the UN was doing this, this, this. And so we end up going to the center that was established at the airport in this town that was totally wiped out. Literally 30,000 people gone. The this, this tsunami comes in and just wiped out the entire, the stench of human decay was apparent 100 feet, 200 feet up in the air in our helicopter ride. We landed this place, I didn't see any blue helmets. Didn't see a single one, didn't see any, I'm, I'm sure they got there eventually, didn't see the UN refugee uh, operation. You know what I saw? The United States Navy. I promise you, in Indonesia, the first people to get there were off, I think, the Ronald Reagan or, or one of the one of our Navy vessels, and people will remember this the rest of their lives. This is America at its best, and this is what we need to restore consistently. We're still the greatest country on the face of the earth. 
Thank you all very much.